Hello, everybody, and welcome to a talk by Peter Samuelson about his new institute at USC. The I'll let him tell you all about that, um, um, both his personality and the things that he's devoted his life to, and I'll let him tell you about that. So, Peter. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. I have to first tell you, I have to say something about the experience for me of being in the Googleplex. In 1984, the Olympics came to Los Angeles, California. It was also the year that uh, I was part of a production company, a film production company called Interscope. And we decided that it was time that there should be a film set on a college campus that wasn't all about the jocks but that was about the nerds. And so we developed a script, started off being called Brains, and it ended up being called Revenge of the Nerds. And uh, for all of these decades since, um, people have said, you're the father of the nerds and things of that kind. <laughs> and I just want to say, as if that's what I am, as father of the nerds, I salute this, the Temple Mount <laughs> of nerdosity. <laughs> clearly, yeah. clearly, this company, these people, are the Revenge of the Nerds. So I'm honored to be here. I thought I'd give you a little bit of background and then uh, tell you about the Media Institute for Social Change at USC, which is my new obsession and the one that we're here to discuss. But I don't think it's possible to really pitch it to you, to tell you about it, until I give you a little bit of background. So I grew up in London. I never did get rid of the accent, I think because I'm probably half deaf, uh, or I've got cloth ears or something. I um, was the first kid in my family to ever go to college. Uh, I got myself into Cambridge on a scholarship. I got a bachelor's, I got a master's, and then I came out of Cambridge, and there was no work of any description anywhere visible in the United Kingdom. So the first job I actually got was working as an interpreter. I had managed to learn medieval French as well as medieval English. So when a film company that was about to make a Steve McQueen film in France decided they needed someone to be an interpreter, I actually did not tell them that the kind of French that I spoke was <laughs> medieval French. And I, I spent the next several months um, making up words for things that they didn't know about yet in medieval times. So I did that and I worked on a series of other American films in Europe, The Return of the Pink Panther and so forth. And I was a lousy interpreter. I always used to say what I thought the people meant as opposed to what they actually said, which was not popular with the people paying me. So I got promoted uh, <laughs> and I became a um, a production assistant, you know, the guy who makes uh, the tea or the coffee. And then I got promoted and promoted and promoted and I became a production manager. But still, it was really challenging at the time, not dissimilar to now, uh, where there's very little work for young people here. In the UK and in Europe, uh, at that time, there was almost nothing. And then one of my wonderful Americans said, you know, you might want to come out to Los Angeles and you could work for us and you know we could give you maybe a year contract so i did and i found myself literally in an office at the corner of hollywood and vine which i suppose was a temple mount of its own uh in the sense of hollywood and i started as a production manager i couldn't get into the union so i had to promote myself to be a producer and i started off as a line producer which is the person who organizes somebody else's film and then I managed to get a film financed, I thought, the first one that I would ever have produced with a credit. Um, it was called A Man, A Woman, and a Bank, and we were going to make it in Vancouver. And I had financed it with money from dozens or hundreds of doctors and dentists in Canada. And just before we were about to start shooting, I got a phone call from the lawyer in Toronto who said, um, don't quite know how to tell you this, but they've changed the law and all of your doctors and dentists will not be investing in your film. 
And I said, well, they can't do that. It's not, it's unconstitutional. They can't retroactive, isn't it grandfather? No, that's America. This is Canada, said the man. So I, w I, I had no money to make this film, but I did have people building the sets. I had a crew in Vancouver. So I didn't really know what to do. I came back down to Los Angeles. Uh, didn't tell anybody that we had the problem. And I read an article in the newspaper about a young man called Ted Field. And it said that he had just turned 25. He had inherited a great deal of money. He was the heir to the Marshall Field family. And he was interested in motion pictures and motor racing, two things that I was quite interested in. So uh, I wrote him a letter. We didn't know where to say it. But the newspaper article said he was a student of philosophy at Pomona College. So that's where we delivered the letter. And Ted phoned me. We had lunch. He said, what are you doing that I could be involved in? I said, well, I'm actually in a crisis. And he said, what do you need? I said, I need half of three and a half million dollars. And he said, OK, let me read the script. So we, I happened to have it with me. And I gave it to him across the table. Uh, and he steamed in. And two days later, uh, a lawyer phoned me and said, where would you like this check delivered? And that's how we made that film. So uh, Ted and I ran Interscope for six, seven years. Then I was bought out. And I've been an independent producer ever since. Uh, Tom and Viv, Wild, Arlington Road. I think I've made 23 films in 25 years. That is one whole side of my life. But the epiphany, the thing that changed my life, is not making films. Uh, of, of the films I've made, um, half a dozen of them I think are quite good. Some of the others we don't talk about or even dare name. Some of them made money, some of them didn't make money. But what changed my life was nothing to do with film. My cousin met a child, an 11-year-old little boy, who was seriously ill, dying in fact, in a hospital in London and asked him, what would make you happy? And the little boy, whose name was Sean, said, oh, that's easy. I want to go to Disneyland, which, considering that he was in a hospital bed in a very bad way with all sorts of equipment and nursing and so forth, my cousin and I said, well, if that's what he wants, that's what we should do. We flew him and his mom to Los Angeles. And the first thing was, they, we couldn't get them into a hotel. So everybody, the cousin, the mum, and the little boy moved into my apartment on Wilshire Boulevard. And for two weeks, we did all the things that you are not supposed to do, for sure, with a seriously ill child. We took him to Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm and on the beach. And we borrowed Ted Field's helicopter. And he went up in that. And he had a fine old time. And he went home with his mum with his Mickey Mouse ears and um, all his other souvenirs, that was not the epiphany. The epiphany, which I, I think has changed my life and a, a lot for the better, is that uh, Sean went back to London and he died. And it was both sad and not sad. Everybody knew he was going to die, including Sean. And we had talked about it uh, at the dinner table. I had a lunch with a man called Steve Yulaki from HBO. He was the commissioning editor. And there I sat in the Regency Club, and I tried to sell him some project. I don't remember what it was, and he didn't buy it anyway. And halfway through the lunch, he said, what else is new and exciting in your life? And I said, well, I've just had this extraordinary experience. And I told him the story of little Sean and the visit. And Steve, the man from HBO, cried. He wept at the lunch table. It was, in one sense, incredibly embarrassing. Uh, he was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. The waiter was embarrassed. It, the whole thing was a complete catastrophe. After we, I, I don't remember how I said goodbye. I'm sure I hope I, I hugged him. And he went off to the men's room to sort of recover. I remember going down in the elevator and thinking, I'm a film producer. We sell stories. I just told someone a story. It had this effect. Maybe I could tell some other people the story, and it would have an effect on them, too. So I did. I called a meeting of a dozen people in the Interscope boardroom after work. 
And I just stood there and I said, look, this is what we just did. This is what happened. This is why I think it had value. Maybe, who knows, we could do it again. There must be a lot of other sick kids in the world and maybe we could help them. Maybe we could make them happy. Wasn't any more complicated than that. And that really was the first meeting of what became the Starlight Children's Foundation. So here we are, it's 30 years later. I won't tell you any of the middle, but what Starlight was in the last fiscal year, uh, we raised a little over $60 million. We served 5.2 million children and their mums and dads and their brothers and their sisters. We have around 50 offices across the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. It's become a very big deal. It's one of the leading children's charities providing psychosocial services to kids who could use a little help uh, in being happier when they're under great stress because of their medical condition. So the clock moves forwards and in the early 90s I got myself a meeting with Steven Spielberg who didn't know me from Adam. But one of the things you learn is you can meet anyone in the world. You just phone up and ask nicely. And uh, mostly you can get in and see them. So I did. And I was told, you have 15 minutes. Don't leave your collateral material with Mr. Spielberg. Leave it out here. And please be gone in 15 minutes. <laughs> so I went in and I was you know, deer in the headlights. I was still there an hour later. I was there two hours later. I was there two and a half hours later. And at the end of it, Stephen said, what do you want me to do? And I said, be the chairman of a new nonprofit. What will we call it, said Stephen. I thought, OK, Starlight, Starbright. I said, it'll be the Starbright <laughs> Children's something. And he said, OK, I'll do it. And what will we do? And I said, we need to provide a, an online, remember the word online, a little early to say that in the early 90s. I said, I, I can see that we are going to link kids together when they can't get out of a hospital bed. And if we do that, I believe that they will help each other and we could also provide distractive entertainment and education and so forth. And Stephen said, OK. And as I was leaving, he said, now, if I'm going to be the chairman, I probably should donate some money. What do you think I should give? And I said, honestly, I, I just don't think I was put on the earth to tell Steven Spielberg, of all people, what he should give to charity. And he said, no, 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 I can always say no. Just give me a number. And I said, no, I'm not going to give you a number. He said, you can't leave unless you give me a number. So I said, I, well, I, have you ever had one of those moments where you sort of feel as though you're not in your body? And I, I, I felt as though I was sort of up here watching my mouth. And my mouth said, two, two and a half million dollars? And there was a silence. And I saw his mouth from up here <laughs> say, OK. <laughs> and I came out. And I actually went and hid behind a tree in the parking lot. And I called my wife. And I said, I think I just had a meeting with Steven Spielberg. I think I was in there two and a half hours. And I think he just donated two and a half million dollars and he's going to be the chairman. But I think I may have hallucinated. And there was a <laughs> silence. And my wife said, um, do you think you're safe to drive? Maybe I should come and get you. So uh, in 1995, Norman Schwarzkopf, Steven Spielberg, and I, at Digital World that June, we pressed a button. And we turned on, I kid you not, the world's first avatar-based, continuously running social network. In 1995, we had kids sitting on the East Coast, video conferencing with kids on the West Coast. You navigated your, you first chose an avatar, and then you navigated it. It was before there was a mouse. So you could only navigate in right angles. It was kind of an etch-a-sketch <coughs> kind of an experience. Because um, to go diagonally, you had to do it in a zigzag. And uh, they received distractive entertainment. Uh, if two avatars bumped in one of the three worlds, it opened up the video conference and you chatted. We had to, it was about a $50 million investment uh, by all sorts of different companies in cash and in kind. It enabled children who couldn't get out of a hospital bed to do so. 
Uh, it obviously evolved. It's never been turned off since. Starbright World runs 24-7. It is supervised by trained people who are paid, staff people, in Los Angeles. And when Los Angeles goes home, they hand off, it's a bit like Houston Mission Control, they hand it off to Sydney, Australia, and they run it through the, the night, their day, and then they give it back in their evening, which is our morning. So that was number two, starlight, star bright, you begin to see the pattern. Number three was that in 1999, I got incredibly angry, pissed off actually, at what goes on with foster kids in America. I just couldn't get my head around it. How can we know best practice, but we don't do it in three quarters of the country? How can we, according to UNICEF, rank one from dead last in the first world when measured by the welfare of children? How can we understand best practice, but we don't do it? Nobody that I know hates children. Why would we marginalize half a million foster kids with appalling outcome stats where one in two ends up homeless within two years of aging out, where at best they end up in minimum wage jobs. They never go to college. 3% of foster youth ever get a college education. So I, I, I got a little bit angry, and sometimes it's good to be angry. And I formed the third nonprofit with Sherry Quirk in Washington. Um, I said, where are all the lobbyists in this city? They all say K Street Northwest. That's where all the office buildings are. And I said, great, that's where we'll open our office. And we will bang away, and we will get laws enacted, enforced, we'll get budgets put in place, and we will be the lobbyists and the advocates for foster kids, because God knows they've got nobody else. They will never march, they are children, you've never read an op-ed, and in fact, because of all the secrecy laws, you've never seen the face of a foster child in the newspaper. So if nobody understands what's going on, and they cannot self-advocate, well then, why would anything ever change? So for a decade, First Star worked top-down, not grassroots. Top-down, um, drive using embarrassment in the press, give school grades by jurisdiction, there are 2,200 jurisdictions, give them A through F, and embarrass the ones with an F. We had a headline in the Boston Globe a couple of years ago, we flunked. That's what you want. You want them saying, you want the legislators to say, how can this be? We have an F, and up the road they get an A minus. What are we doing wrong? Let's go emulate them. So um, first our top down for a decade, and then one of my board members, Kathleen Reardon, who's a professor at USC in the business school, she said, so I've been studying this. Everybody agrees that the most difficult kids to place are foster kids because whereas you can find a foster home perhaps for a little girl of eight, if it's a six foot one 16 year old boy, there's a whole higher hurdle to jump. So those kids end up in what used to be called group homes, but group homes are so terrible that they got renamed congregate care, which didn't make them any better. So, but we do that in America, we change the name because we think somehow that will miraculously improve things so these group homes are mostly run by private entities under government contract. They have 100 beds, they have 75 beds, they have 200 beds. They are warehousing. They are, in many cases, not all, there are a few good ones, but almost all of them are dreadful. And they guarantee that kids will come out when they turn 18 normally and will go straight into unemployment, welfare, uh, uh, criminality or whatever it is that they've learned in there and as I said half of them end up homeless within two years so Kathleen said so I've had a, a better idea maybe I don't know it's it's like a huge idea but I can't really I don't know what I got here tell me what you think if we put one of these group homes somewhere better and I said well where would you put it Kathleen and she said well what would you have if you put it on the campus of a four-year university what if you put a group home, call it a boarding school, for foster youth in 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, smack in the middle of a four-year university campus? I said, well, the first thing you'd have is, let's say, 25,000 undergraduate potential big brothers and big sisters. The second thing that you would have would be 
you've got every kind of expert. How many psychiatrists do you need? Do you want some social workers? How about people who measure things? What about some educators? We have a whole school of education. I said, I, I have to believe it's been done. So we got a couple of grad students. We looked all around the world, not just in the United States. No one had ever done that. So we did it. Uh, I went and got a meeting with the chancellor of UCLA. And I said, hello, you don't know me, but we have this idea. And he said, have you read my 10-year plan? And I said, no, Chancellor Block, I'm an idiot. I haven't read your 10-year plan. It would have been a really good idea. He said, I'll read you two sentences. And he takes it out, and he runs his finger down. He says, um, UCLA, as a taxpayer-funded public university, will strive in every way possible to build affirmative pathways to post-secondary education for young people, none of whose family members have ever previously had that advantage. He says, check one. And he runs his finger down and he says, UCLA will try in every way possible to use all of its academic skills, its prodigious academic skills, to be the most excellent neighbor to the community surrounding it, the community of greater Los Angeles. He says, check. He says, you think you can raise the money for this thing? I said, I, I'm clueless, I don't know, but we can try. He says, OK, well, if you can raise the money, we'll do it. So we did raise the money, and we did do it. So our first academy started two years ago on the UCLA campus. We now have three, because we, uh, a year later, we set up George Washington University in DC. And we also are at the University of Rhode Island. We're about to add a major university in Connecticut and another major university in Illinois. I, just before Christmas, I was in Washington. Uh, I met with the Department of Education, the Department of Health and Human Services. I met with uh, the staffers of 10 members of Congress. I met a senator. Uh, this is a very, very big idea. We don't know what percentage of these kids we will get into college, but it will be one heck of a lot more than 3%, which is the benchmark if we don't intervene. So you get the pattern, starlight, star bright, first star, I couldn't think of anything to call I see tonight. So I, I did something different. One of the things that has served me really well in my life is if I'm kind of scared of something, I sort of take a deep breath and do it. And I decided I was scared of homeless people. So I did 62 interviews with homeless people while riding my bicycle on weekends. The first thing I found out is I thought they were all men. And they're not all men. They are 60% male, 40% female. I thought they were all middle-aged men. No, actually 18% are under the age of 18. Sorry, 15% are under the age of 18. Uh, there's children sleeping rough. I thought when I asked them, where'd you go to bed at night? I thought they'd all say, I go to the shelter, I go to the mission, I go somewhere like that, the Salvation Army. So it turns out, just in Greater Los Angeles, the county, uh, we have 65,000 in the most recent census homeless people, uh, but we only have about 14,000 beds in shelters. So whichever way you cut it, we have tens of thousands of men and women and children sleeping you know, in the scrubland off the freeway, behind the pillar. You, you, you know where they are. They're where you see them. You think there are no women and children because they hide better, I discovered. The epiphany, and I believe in epiphanies for me, was that an old lady, when I asked her, where do you sleep at night, my dear? She said, come on, I'll show you. She takes me behind some bushes, behind a pillar, off of the uh, 405 freeway, and there is a huge cardboard box. And on the side of the cardboard box, which is her home, it says Sub-Zero. And I thought, OK, that's the epiphany, because I got the refrigerator, she got the cardboard box, <laughs> What the hell is this? It's, um, this is America. We have money. So my first thought was, I'll build shelters. But when you run the math, it's about $50,000 per bed that you generate, and that's just to build it. So 100 beds, $5 million kind of math. So I said, OK, 50,000 times, say, 60,000 people. Oh, wait a minute. That's $3 billion. I have no clue how you raise $3 billion. So I said, OK. Never daunted, what's the best we can do with 500 bucks a head? What could we build with $500? So I tried to draw a thing. I knew in the daytime you, it would have wheels, you would push it around. 
and then at night you would park it, you would open it up somehow, and it would turn into a cot with, with, with sort of a tent over it and some doors and windows and off the ground. I tried to design this thing. I have the spatial ability of a newt. So I thought, well, who, who knows how to do this? See, film producers actually don't know how to do anything. All we know how to do is hire people who know vastly better than us. So I went to the Pasadena Art Center College of Design. I went to Dean Korshek and I said, have you ever done like a non-profit design? Pro no, we haven't. And I said, well, couldn't we have a prize? I'll put up the little bit of prize money. Uh, he said, what do you want to call this thing? Because I described it. And I said, um, I don't know. We can call it whatever you like. Anyway, by the end of the meeting, we had decided it was called an EDAR, E-D-A-R, because everyone deserves a roof. So uh, we had the competition. I've been working with Eric Lindemann and Jason Zaza, who were in the competition ever since. We got a fabrication house. We built, I think, 50 in the first batch. We gave them away on Skid Row. We got the Rand Institute to do an efficacy study. And we're up to, this is only in the last, say, three years, we're up to about 300 people who sleep in them now every night um, in greater Los Angeles. Uh, it is, I like to say, on a scale of 10, if 10 is an apartment with a nice warm bed, uh, and if zero is a cardboard box on a rainy night, so we're a five. Uh, it's nowhere near as good as the apartment, but it's one hell of a lot better than the cardboard box. And three weeks ago, uh, end of last year, uh, we got the patent uh, issued. So we actually now are patent holders, which is great because it means that we can hopefully sell them to other for-profit entities and then we can take the, the money and give them obviously for free to yet more homeless people. So I had this really happy life until April of last year. I made my films, I raised my family, and I did Starlight and Starbright and First Star at EDAR. Very happily. I thought, I'll do this another 10, 15 years, and then I'll hang it up and I'll read the New York Times. At which point, I got a phone call from USC, from the chairman of film, a man called Michael Taylor. And he said, come have some lunch with me. So we had some lunch, which led to more meetings with him, which led to meeting the dean. Uh, and by the end of all of this, we had decided that there was no good reason why there would not be, and every good reason why there should be, a new institute at USC within the film school, which we have called the Media Institute for Social Change. And faced with running this thing, you know, as part of a team, I'm the managing director, I had to make a decision whether I was going to continue to produce films or was I actually going to do this. And I decided that the opportunity was so enormous that really I had to do it. So the Media Institute for Social Change has five programs. And I suppose at its core, it's why I'm standing here in front of you in the Revenge of the Nerds of Google. So the first thing is, we are already teaching and we want to teach much more media for social change. What is it? How do you do it? How do you audiovisually create a moment of empathy? And while the person, the audience member, is moved in their heart, how do you give them an action point so that they will vote, donate, volunteer, recycle, whatever it is that you want them to do. Absolutely, chip away, raise awareness, it's not without value, but really the highest value is you want people to do something that they weren't previously doing or weren't doing enough. So we're teaching it, we're teaching undergraduate courses, we're teaching graduate courses, and as we raise more money, we will do more and more and more courses. The goal is to send forth a legion, a battalion of pro-social media makers into the world as we graduate students who with all, for some of them, or with part of their time, will affirmatively struggle to make, using their audiovisual skills that they've learned, the world into a better place. The timing is particularly fortunate. Number one, you may have noticed there are quite a lot of problems in the world. 
Some of them are intractable. Some of them are susceptible to study, to science. Others require a massive change of thought. They require people to think differently and to prioritize differently. You can try and do that at the point of a gun. You can try and do it by persuading people with science. But really, really, the way that people are moved is emotionally, and you don't do that. You can scare the hell out of them with a gun, but you are unlikely to affect a lifelong change when you're no longer pointing the gun. The camera is a lot more powerful in this business of changing hearts and minds than either a gun or logical persuasion. Because what we are doing is creating a moment of emotion. We are then suggesting, after all due research, an action step, and we are inviting people to join the cause. Now, who is our audience? This is where it gets really exciting. Who is the Google audience, and who is the audience for motion picture, television, interactive video games, both in a box and massive multiplayer, and all the online stuff? We take a very broad view of what media may be. It's all of those things. It's documentary, it's fiction, it's long form, it's short form. We're kind of platform agnostic because God knows the platform changes every 10 minutes. Who is the audience? Well, increasingly, the, the rising wedge is Gen Y. What do we know about Generation Y? Young people aged currently between, say, 15 and the late 20s. The answer is, it's the most pro-social generation of young Americans since 1937. They are more volunteering, more donating, than either of the two prior generations of young Americans, their parents' generation, their grandparents' generation. You actually have to go back to the Great Depression to find another generation that really said, oh dear, this world is really fragile. I'd better do something about it. I'd better do my bit. I'd better pay something back in. I can't just take and take and take. I need to exert myself and make my world a better place. We're all in this thing together. Then they had the Second World War, where a lot of young people fought and saw terrible sights. Uh, and they came back, and that generation have been incredibly philanthropic ever since. The present generation, Gen Y, is more philanthropic, more, more caring, even than them when measured by volunteering. The interesting thing is, young people start volunteering in high school because you can't go to college without it, and you need to put it on your, trans on your, your resume. But the interesting thing is, even when they get into college and after college, they carry on volunteering because they realize hey, that made me feel really good. So our audience, we do not have to teach them that the world is a fragile place and that everyone needs to help to make it better. We also do not need to teach young people to pick up any kind of a video camera or their PDA with a video camera in it and point it. They even sometimes know how to edit. What we do have to do is to teach them to be excellent storytellers. We have to go back to that basic equation, audio-visually create empathy, and then couple it with the action step. Now, the action step is easier said than done. The first thing is, don't be evil, do no harm. Very much aware where I'm standing and what's written on the, I actually didn't see it on this trip. I don't know which wall it's written on, the don't be evil, but I salute that. The first thing you have to do if you want to be a pro-social media maker is you better do a bit of research and work out what the truth is. You, you, you have to validate what it is you're persuading people to do because God forbid that you would have them do something that would make things worse. You can't make a film about autism without understanding something a lot about autism because it's the bully pulpit. People will think you must be an expert because you made the film or you made the webisode or whatever it may be so don't be evil, do your research. So one component of what we're teaching undergraduate and grad students is how to get your issue right, where to go and find the experts. This is where it's brilliant being on a college campus because we got all the experts. Walk 300 yards and there's an expert in whatever it may be. So mission one already underway is teach undergraduate and grad students how to be excellent, motivated, proficient, pro-social media makers. 
It's that Venn diagram between media generation and make the world a better place. It's the lozenge in the middle that we're teaching. The second thing, and this is why I'm banging around raising money at the moment, is we want to do scholarships. We think that media is the great transformer. It is the great leap from the way things are to the way they can be. So what we want to start doing increasingly is offering scholarships and other student support where basically we're saying to underprivileged kids, whether they're in a city, whether they are um, from the Native American Navajo reservation, wherever they may be where things are not right, things are not just, things are not good enough, there is poverty, there is deprivation, there is inadequate opportunity, we're saying to them, okay, come to USC, we will put you through these courses, you will come out at the other end as a proficient, pro-social, qualified, trained media maker. And your part of the bargain, the grand bargain, is that you need to go back where you come from, perhaps not with all your time, you go have a bang up commercial career, but with a significant proportion of your caring and your time, you need to know that you have an affirmative moral obligation to make your people have better lives. Go back where you came from, a little bit like Teach for America, and lift up your community. So that's the second thing is student support. The third thing is everything you can imagine that an institute should do, and that other institutes, but not on this subject, in fact, do. What is the history of pro-social media? First of all, what is pro-social media? Lenny Riefenstahl, excellent documentarian, clearly not pro-social, made her films entirely for Hitler. I don't think we would say she was pro-social. What about Michael Moore? Michael Moore makes films that a lot of us agree with, but he never puts the other side of the argument in. Do you need to do that or don't you need to do that? What is fair in the context? Can you, what, where is the line between polemic or political and truth in media? What is your obligation? Do you have one? I'm not suggesting any answers to that, but it is an issue that needs to be endlessly debated, and you may have noticed that universities are good at debating things. It's something that has to be front of mind when you, in this case, don't put pen to paper, but put um, uh, recording media into camera. So, the history. Another whole area where this is huge and largely untapped is what is efficacy? If it doesn't work, why do we waste time, treasure, and caring to do it? When does it work? There's all sorts of anecdotal uh, evidence that things work, and sometimes it's been measured. We know that when the Felicity Huffman character in the primetime soap Desperate Housewives, uh, they, they gave her breast cancer in the story. And we know that uh, mammograms in America rose 30% in the month following that first broadcast. And we know that if you run those numbers out, several or many thousands of American women uh, did not die of breast cancer because of early diagnosis, which they got because they were watching, quote unquote, a silly soap opera, which is what reminded them they needed to go and get tested. So we know that these examples exist. I would suggest to you there are other examples where they didn't move the needle at all. Coney 2012. So you can quibble with content. Uh, Coney, at the time the film came out in April last year, hadn't actually been in Uganda for three years. So what were we really advocating? That the Ugandan army should go to a different country to catch him? Not sure. Uh, furthermore, the Ugandan army itself has child soldiers. So uh, were we really advocating that one lot of child soldiers should go and catch and liberate another lot of child soldiers? Not sure. You can quibble about content, but even if you just assume that it was completely accurate, what good did it do? Is there actually one child soldier in East Africa who isn't a child soldier today as a result of the most successful viral video in the history of the world? 100 million hits in eight days. Uh, enormous success. I said to the managing director or executive director, whatever he is, of the organization that made it that regardless of what he did for Africa, I felt that his gift to the world was that he said to young videographers, young filmmakers, you know, you actually could aspire 
to 100 million views for your video. And that might be, if you get it right, if you do your research, if you do it empathetically, uh, you actually could change the world. So I think that the great gift of, that, of Invisible Children and of Coney 2012 uh, is perhaps nothing to do with Africa. It has to do with what I'm talking about, which is that a camera is more powerful than a sword or a gun, uh, but we need to get it right and we need to do more pro-social media. The other stuff that institutes do are seminars and colloquia. Our, our, our fourth thing that we're doing is to really try to introduce causes that could use a little help to media makers, whether they're students or professionals, who could give them that help. Uh, there are too many secret causes for good uh, where simply they don't know, nobody out there knows what the orphan cause may be. So that has to do with introducing uh, a, the foundation that is trying to find a cure for a disease to the showrunner of a television series which could feature them, which would then drive people through the end credits or, or the website of the... Um, I did a thing last night for Starlight where we approached um, The Bachelor. And you would think that the ABC show The Bachelor, not very philanthropic, they actually said, oh God, we would love to feature Starlight. Uh, we've had a deluge this morning of support and tweets and so forth because last night two of Starlight's special kids went with on a date to Magic Mountain uh, and they were on The Bachelor and it got great ratings. We can laugh about it and we can say, well, wouldn't it be better to raise money from you know, foundations that give to causes that support seriously ill kids? Yes, absolutely, we do all of that too. But actually, The Bachelor got seen by, what, a thousand times more people than we would otherwise be able to approach in any given month? Uh, it's a lot. It's powerful. It's the megaphone. So then the last thing that we're working on, and we haven't done it yet, is we want to do a media awards. We think that in the run-up to the Academy Awards, which as you well know, they're next month, every month, every year they're in February, uh, and there are all those other award shows on the way to the um, Oscars. There's the Golden Globes and the National Board of Review and all the rest of it. We think that there should be the pro-social awards. We think that a university is who should sponsor it with corporate help. In the end, maybe not year one, we think it should be televised. And we're talking about the same categories. We're first of all talking about motion picture, television, interactive and online. And secondly, we're talking about actor, actress, creative team, production team, maybe lifetime achievement, uh, maybe a corporate award, but everything measured rigorously by pro-social intent and pro-social efficacy. So we're pulling that together at the moment. My life has completely been turned upside down. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I was a film producer. I'm now a recovering film producer. I'm the managing director of the Media Institute. I consider that I'm honored and privileged, really, to have been given this great big bully pulpit uh, of USC. USC is absolutely the place to do this. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm standing here is that Stanford, by act of God, has no film school. Uh, if it did, none of you would be here because uh, you would already be involved somehow with them if you cared about these issues. The USC Film School is either co-equally the best or the best film school in the world. It is certainly, indubitably, the one that is the most related to Hollywood. And uh, our graduates are everywhere across the broadest possible span of professional motion picture, television, interactive, video games, online, and all the rest of it. The reason why I've thrown over what was, as my wife points out a lot, uh, a really viable career uh, and that I'm doing this is it's the first time in my whole life that someone has enabled me to do in one room at one time the things that I care about. I care about young people and their future in the world. I care about media and its power and I care about making the world a better place. 
for the very first time, these things have been brought together. I got a taste of it when Jeff Skoll asked me to go on the original three-person board of participant media. And Jeff has made an enormous success of that company. He has not only made the world a better place, but he has done it in the context of actually, you know, earning money and breaking even and doing better than that. So there is evidence that this works. I remember early in the, the life of that company, sitting in front of a major studio uh, president who said, I know you are in good faith. Let me explain the motion picture industry to you. People have miserable little lives. They are largely unhappy. They go to a multiplex and they pay 12 or so dollars to sit in the dark for two hours. And we make them happy. And when they come out after two hours, they go back to their miserable shitty lives and we have their money. That is the motion picture industry. And I said, um, what about, uh, you know, catharsis, Aristotle's poetics, Shakespeare's tragedy? He says, yeah, but, but not now. Motion pictures are an escapist medium. No one will ever go to see something with a message. I believed then that he was wrong. It was easier to believe it then because Jeff Skoll had the staying power to prove that it was wrong. I do believe that we can teach a legion of young people. Think of the leverage. If we turn out two, three, four hundred students a year, if they each go off and in their career make a hundred or a thousand pieces of output, and if each of those is seen by a hundred thousand or a million or ten or a hundred million people, this is an enormously powerful initiative. So we'll go to a q and A. I uh, hope I haven't bent your ear too long. I'm watching the clock. My life at the moment is passionately believing that we can do something incredibly important here with MISC, the Media Institute for Social Change. I do believe that here at Google, there are people who have personally taken part in transformational change. I would immodestly say to you that the difference between Google's effect on the world, which has been radical, dramatic, a multiplier, and for the good, and what we are doing in MISC is as just started, and Google's been doing it longer and in a different direction. But I believe that in the end of the end, there will be these media institutes in film schools around the world. We will welcome them copying us. I think we are inventing and others will emulate. The world is a fractured and broken place, but winning hearts and minds is how we defeat the sense of otherness. It is how we draw people together to find common solutions. It is how we affect leadership and compromise. That is what we are trying to do with cameras of one kind or another. I'm very grateful for your time in listening to this, and I hope that there may be some way. I brought, I brought a pocket full of uh, business cards. Uh, you, especially those of you who have participated in one of the world's greatest IPOs, should you believe that the multiplier of media deserves a bit of help and support? I'm your man. If you have ideas on coursework, on partnership opportunities, whatever, uh, I would love to discuss them also. I'm coming back up on February 15. I've actually been asked uh, to show uh, my film Revenge of the Nerds at the hub. I'm incredibly uh, trepidatious because uh, A, I haven't seen it for 20 years. B, I do know that when we made it in the mid 80s, the computers were the size of a bus. Uh, I think it was before K-Pro and Osborne, which was my, uh, my introduction to personal computers. So God knows what is in it. I don't even know if it's funny anymore. But we're going to show the film at the Hub the evening of February 15. And then I'm going to be back, back up the week of March 5. We are very eager to work with quote unquote Silicon Valley. Um, you guys need content. You've got the hardware and the software. Uh, 
in the area of content, I think we can try and uh, create that Venn diagram of what does good as well as what is commercial. We can do what is noble and honorable as well as what makes a buck. So thank you very much. And if there are any questions, there's a microphone over there. And I'm sure I don't know any of the answers, but uh, we can punt. As I sit here, I'm just entranced with what you've said. And I have a lot of questions. But the first one is, if you were to construct a list of the top three things that you would want from a group like this, what, what would those be? What are you looking for? One, and I'll just be transparent and honest. One, we are eight months into our institute. We need money. Because the more money, the more scholarships, the more programs, the more research, and so forth, which then self-replicate. So we are, in my view, still priming the pump. And the currency of uh, acceleration is money, like most other things. Secondly, partnership. I'm particularly interested in understanding how technology can make the world a better place when you add into the trifecta uh, technology, make the world a better place, and content. How do we technologically move hearts and minds by placing content within the technology uh, that has that aspiration? And then also, I believe that measurement is something that a lot of people here are very good at. Uh, and um, I think we're not necessarily good at measurement yet. It's psychologists measure all sorts of human behavior. Not a lot of that has crossed the street into the area of pro-social media to try to understand whether we are being efficacious. Uh, a film like The Blind Side, Sandy Bullock took a minuscule fee, took a year of her life, and made that film. Did it move the needle, I'm not saying it did or it didn't, uh, in race relations and in understanding the challenges of kids in the inner city? What did it cost and what was its value to the world? And I don't mean to pick on it, it was a fine film. I think we need to measure this stuff and another thing that may be possible is the Venn diagram where technology and measurement overlap. Just, just to follow on that, I'll sit down. Um, when you say partnership, is it the, the big world of working with technology developers to try and create something that's in your head? Or is it more of an ongoing, how do you disseminate uh, some of the ideas and finding a platform by which it can get out faster, or is it both? I think it's both, uh, and if I knew exactly what it was, I wouldn't be standing here being um, deliberately a little vague. I, I do believe that we have many opportunities to take what we know about content and what you, for one, know about technology and also about the community up here, and the real excitement is to say, here we are, here is the effect we would like to have. What are the technological, financial, pedagogic, and educational, generally, things we can do with technology-enabled media that would actually shift that needle and make the world better? Give you one example. Um, so politics, you may have noticed, is completely screwed up in the United States because there's no middle anymore. Everything I've ever led, what the leader is supposed to do is to find the middle. Right. Everything worth doing, you can't please everybody, but you find most common ground in the middle. Well, people hate each other now in Washington. They won't even sit next to each other. How can we use media to find that middle? How can we help democracy to flourish and thrive using content? And where, what is technology's place as a partner in doing that? Great. Th thank you very much. I want to say thank you to everybody uh, for your time and caring a little bit about this. Uh, I'm going to take an enormous stack of business cards and I'm going to put them on that podium and keep a few in my pocket. Uh, if you would like to discuss this further one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I'd be honored. And as I said, I'm back up here for a couple of days that include the day after Valentine's Day, have to be in LA for Valentine's Day. But the next day, the 15th, I will be back up here. And uh, if you'd like to sit down, have a cup of coffee, and talk about this further, uh, you are the Revenge of the Nerds. I'd be honored to do that. Thank you.